I'm Mark Kelly. Tonight on The Fifth Estate, a story about a drug that may be coming soon to a corner store near you. This is the good stuff. This is a Cheech and Chong's dream, man. Marijuana. It's been maligned for decades. Under the influence of the drug, he killed his entire family with an axe. Outlawed in Canada since 1923. So why then is this country awash in pot? Rockstar, black tuna, Girl Scout cookies? It's the most commonly used illegal drug in Canada. How much revenue is this thing generating? Six figures. And you won't believe where you can buy it now. All right, guys, I'm going around passing out joints. Most Canadians want to see the laws change like they've been in Colorado. You don't look like a pot thrower. <laughs> As marijuana goes mainstream, legalization is now a smoking hot political issue. But the government says dope will never be legal in Canada. We're strongly opposed to the legalization of drugs. It will not happen under our government. Is that prediction just one of the many pot fictions? So if the federal government is so committed to keeping the sale of illegal weed off our city streets, you can imagine my surprise when I was in Vancouver this fall working on an unrelated story, and one day, I was randomly stopped on the street. But here, did he, did he grab a card? And offered a membership in a medical marijuana club. We sell different type of buds. We also have edibles and oils. All I had to do was pass a medical test with their in-house specialist, and this woman told me how. So what do I say, though? I just say that... Um, maybe stress. Stress? Yeah. Or okay, well, I'm stressed. Everyone's a little stressed. Yeah. We can use a toke or two once in a while. And when can I do that? If you go right now, there's no lineup. Okay. So if you cross the street, you can get it right now. Minutes later, I was in the clinic, waiting for my consultation with a naturopath. Hello. Hey there. Did you want to become a member? I did, yeah. He wasn't in the room or in the building for that matter. He was on Skype. How are you doing? It's my first ever Skype consultation. Um, I find uh, I've got a lot of stress in my life and the stress is causing me a lot of uh, insomnia. I'm really having a hard time sleeping and when I take um, the sleeping pills I find I'm, I'm in t rough shape for the next day. Okay. And uh, any other medical concerns I should be aware of? Nope. Nope. That's it? Yeah. Okay. And then uh, what kind of medication do you Nope, not at all. Nope. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Have a good night. All right, you too. I'm told a consultation usually takes between 10 and 20 minutes, but my consultation, well, it lasted just 65 seconds. Now I'm a member at Canna Clinic, where I can go and purchase as much marijuana as they think is good for me right across at that clinic. It was that easy. Now hold on. You can't buy marijuana from a corner store, right? Well, officially, no. Medical marijuana has been legally sold in Canada since the year 2001 under strict government rules. First, you need to get a prescription from a doctor. Then you have to order it online from a licensed producer. And then wait. Your marijuana will be mailed to you. But here's the reality. In Vancouver, marijuana stores or dispensaries are popping up everywhere. Some people say they don't want to wait for mail order marijuana. Others say they don't want the hassle of trying to get a prescription. In recent months, the number of dispensaries in Vancouver has doubled. But you never thought you'd see a guy in a tie selling weed. <laughs> They're now about 60. That's more than the number of Tim Hortons in town. Here you can buy and prep your purchases. Marijuana is sold for smoking, sold for eating, or if you're health conscious, then how about a pot smoothie? Vancouver police have said they'll allow the stores to stay open as long as they don't sell to kids or become a neighborhood nuisance. And business at these dispensaries is booming, especially here at this one, artfully called the BC Pain Society. 
Owner Chuck Vorabioff has something none of his competitors have. Canada's first marijuana vending machine. The machine pumps out bags of weed, ranging from six bucks a gram to a half ounce for $80. So Chuck, what I want to know is how many times a day do you have to do this? Oh, four or five or six. I could use somebody full-time filling and maintaining it. Chuck already had a vending machine business, but after helping a friend dying of cancer get marijuana to treat his pain, he saw a need. And when the police announced they wouldn't bust dispensaries, he saw a business opportunity, and a great one. How much revenue is this thing generating? Let's put it this way, it's um, six figures since we've been open, but that, further than that, I'm not positive. But you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes. From this machine. Yes. In a matter of months. Yes. It's a members only machine. Patients need to be 18 or over and consult with a nurse or a notary to prove they have a medical need. Okay, and if you guys want, we have more gumballs going in right now. What's in here is one gram of high quality marijuana for four dollars. Chuck, you've got a great business set up here, I can see that, but I don't want to spoil the party. It's illegal. Yes, according to the Criminal Code of Canada. Well, that's, that's, that's the law. Yeah, well, yes. We live in Vancouver. Vancouver City Police and the City Hall has allowed us to regulate our own business. Uh, Vancouver City Police have made it clear um, that this is not a priority to them. They came in, they looked around, uh, they gave us some safety pointers how to keep our staff and our customers safe, and they left happy. And his booming illegal business is the city's worst kept secret. He put up this big banner to take advantage of the commuter trains that pass by every two minutes. Everyone looking out this sky train window, guess what? They see our big sign there and our uh, 4 by 10 foot sign right there. There's no hiding what you're doing here. Absolutely not, no, no. And we're, we're not doing anything to hide. Here in Vancouver, dispensaries aren't just growing like weeds, they're cooking up new ways to sell their weed. These are for people that do not want to smoke. Chocolate chip cookies, chocolate coconut truffles, little caramel sticks, gummy bears, uh, fudge brownies, Rice Krispies. Mateo Suleiman is part owner of the Sea to Sky dispensary. He's a new generation potrepreneur, pushing the boundaries of the law. But all of these are illegal. All of these right now are illegal, and all of these right here serve a purpose. And that's the only reason why they're here. Until he got into the medical marijuana business, Matteo ran a pizzeria and enjoyed getting high in his spare time. Cannabis is Now he sees himself as a pot pioneer, poised to cash in on what he and his partner Max Jahanger see as the business opportunity of a lifetime. Such a new market, it's like... It's like uh, how Canada was 100 years ago. Just everything starting off, this is the same way, starting off and we want to have our foot in the door before the door closes, basically, you know what I mean? Their storefront is all window and the store itself is located not far from the local police station. We opened up all our windows where people can see inside, know that we have nothing to hide and that we're doing something good for the community. Hello, see the sky, how can I help you? This is Doctor Day, where new customers come see an in-house nurse practitioner to get their membership. Once they have their medical note, they have access to a treasure trove of marijuana-infused products. Behind closed doors in the members-only dispensing room, there are products from marijuana-infused olive oil, massage oil, to cookie jars filled with high-potency dried marijuana bud. So this is it, this is like ground zero here. So this is ground zero. Rockstar, yeah. Black Tuna, Master Kush, Girl Scout cookies? Yes, actually. <laughs> Love potion, so this is clearly medicinal. Uh, clearly medicinal. I know, some may question their dedication to medical science, but everyone take a deep breath. Uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna medicate for you. If the police and the public can live with a place like this, 
Why can't the federal government? <coughs> Very powerful. Jeez. That's what these guys want to know. This to me looks like it's been legalized already. That's what our goal is here is we want to legalize. We want everybody to have access to cannabis. Cannabis is a good thing. And what we will do, me and Max together, to try to help out this whole process is that we're going to expand and we're going to expand into all of Canada. As of right now, like we do service to all of Canada. So it's Vancouver today and And it's Nova tomorrow. Scotia tomorrow. Yeah. And then so and then on Toronto, and so on and, and it, so on. Of course, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, Ontario, all these places we are actually working on right now. You're going to take at the whole moment. country. Try yeah. to, yeah, one province at a time, right? <laughs> when we come back, we take you inside one of the biggest legal grow ops in the world. This is the Green Rush. This is the Green Rush, right this here. This is what it's all about. This is what it's all about, right here. And you'll never guess where it is. Grow-ops were run by criminals, shady drug dealers growing black market marijuana in some suburban neighborhood until the police shut it down. But grow-ops have grown up. Want to see the new breed of grow-ops? We'll drive northeast from Saskatoon along the Pure Prairie Highway and there's an unmarked turnoff that takes you onto a dirt road, then to the gates of a nondescript building. You'd never guess what was inside. It's a field of dreams. More than 150,000 square feet of growing space, about the size of two and a half football fields. Probably the biggest legal marijuana grow up in the world. Wow. Run by a prairie boy named Brent Zettel. This is the, uh, this is the good stuff. This is a Cheech and Chong's dream, man. If I'm looking over this, what is this worth right here? Uh, about, well, it, oh, just under $300,000. He's been growing marijuana now for 15 years. And an interesting dynamic is that every single marijuana plant has a different smell. So the staff know these plants by their numbers, but they also know them immediately by their smells. His business has the smell of success. Not bad when you consider growing up on a farm in Saskatchewan. He says he never even touched the stuff. Me and my buddies, we drank. I didn't even know. Truth is, I hadn't ever seen a live plant until I actually got the contract with Health Canada. So I hadn't ever seen it, even if I saw what a plant looked like. That's the way we want every crop to be. Right? Back in 2000, Zettel opened Canada's first ever medical marijuana grow up in an abandoned zinc mine. Back then, he was the only licensed producer for Health Canada. But his business, called Prairie Plant Systems, outgrew the mine. So he built this facility. And since then, he's watched the market grow as all those baby boomers find a renewed reason to smoke. There's a demographic, the baby boomer demographic, who has these conditions coming in that are, that where medical cannabis seems to be influencing or providing some symptom relief. Our baby boomers are getting older and they're starting to reach those kind of things, such as osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, MS, oncology, and those kinds of things. Here they treat weed like a prescription drug working in controlled conditions, carefully cloning seeds and petri dishes, creating standardized potency in the plants. It seems more like a pharmaceutical company than a big box grow up. And just like a pharmaceutical company, it's all about quality control. And just like a pharmaceutical company, they're paying for research, hoping to discover that marijuana is the miracle cure for something that ails us. But the evolution of this drug is starting to reach a point where we're really beginning to understand its potential and its impacts. 
And it's only fitting Canada's biggest grow-up should produce the biggest bag of pot you'll likely ever see in your lifetime. So do the math for me, what is this worth? Well, uh, if you were doing a $10,000 a kilogram, it'd be worth $25,000. But after 14 years in business, Zettel is now facing a new reality, competition. Ever since the government revamped the rules and handed out 14 more licenses to grow medical marijuana. Now small town Canada is scrambling to get a piece of the pot pie. Towns like Smith Falls, Ontario, the town council didn't worry one bit when they were approached by a grow-up called Tweed that wanted to set up shop in town. No, it, it wasn't, wasn't a consideration at all. And Former Mayor I, I Dennis Staple that. says it was an offer the town wouldn't or couldn't refuse. No, no, no. I mean, at that point, Smith Falls had lost six of our major employers, a total of 1,700 jobs in a community of 9,000. I, I did not want to be the mayor that stood up to our public and said, oh, in addition to losing 1,700 jobs, I've just turned on 100 jobs today. I, I came to the conclusion, or our council came to the conclusion, uh, these applications are going to be considered for locations throughout Canada, so why not Smith Falls? And why not the former Hershey Chocolate Factory, which was shuttered in 2008 and slated for demolition until Tweed came along? Tweed was the first publicly traded marijuana company in Canada. Investors quickly turned the startup into a business worth about $100 million. It sells marijuana in pill bottles, featuring sophisticated brand names like Herringbone, Argyle, and Baker Street. Tweed indeed. But pot's not just appealing to small towns, but also to big names. Startups have attracted names like former Prime Minister John Turner, former BC Premier Mike Harcourt, and former Ontario Health Minister George Smitherman. Liberal Senator Larry Campbell is an advisor to one company. So is former police chief and current BC MLA Cash Heed. They're all part of the green rush. That's Canada's modern day gold rush. In the past year, tens of millions of dollars have been poured into building new big box grow ups right across the country. And remember, this is just to grow medical marijuana. Imagine how big the bud boom would be if Canada and other countries were to legalize recreational marijuana. It appears that's what some companies are banking on. He advocates for the positive power of the earth. A Seattle-based company recently paid millions to the family of the late reggae superstar Bob Marley to use his name and image to create an international marijuana brand. Yep, even Bob Marley's gone corporate. Make way for the positive day. We're in the midst of a transformation, a transformation from uh, a black market to a legal market. And part of that process is the creation of mainstream brands. Meet the man who bought Bob Marley. Brendan Kennedy is CEO of the venture capital firm Privateer. And you know where his only grow up is? We made a direct investment in Canada. We've invested $20 million in this facility. It's located in, in beautiful Nanaimo, British Columbia, and we've created 100 Canadian jobs, and we're really interested in creating more jobs in Canada. We've got 16 rooms here, uh, four upstairs, four downstairs, four upstairs, and four downstairs that will uh, be approved and we'll start... Kennedy is advanced. bullish about the Canadian marijuana market. His Tilray facility is waiting for Health Canada approval to expand. More growing rooms, more plants, more patients. So this is the packaging and shipping room. There are only about 14,000 Canadians using the new medical marijuana mail order business. But Health Canada predicts that number will eventually grow to nearly half a million. So who's bankrolling this grow up? Well, international angel investors. Many who openly support legalization in countries like the US and Canada. Until that happens, 
Kennedy hopes the grow up that built in BC will be the model used for global expansion. So this is possibly just the beginning of something much bigger. You know, our our intent is to take the uh, take the Canadian brand that we've built, Tilray, and migrate it to other countries that have legalized medical cannabis. Corporations have now figured out what criminals knew all along. There's plenty of money to be made selling pot. Just how much? Bigger than you probably imagined. Worldwide, it's a $150 billion business. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. When we come back, we go to Colorado. All right, guys, I'm going around passing out joints. Where recreational marijuana is now legally sold in stores to see what Canada's future could look like. Just how high are you guys right now? Like in terms of like three quarters or like five quarters. carved out of the rugged American frontier by pioneers. They created a Rocky Mountain refuge for that pioneer spirit. For example, women were given the vote here two decades before the rest of the country. And now those pioneers are blazing another bold new trail. It's been a year since the sun rose on a new era, as Colorado became the first jurisdiction in the world to allow the retail sales of marijuana to anyone aged 21 and over. Now, critics said the sky would fall and crime would rise and this state would never again be the same. So we've come here to see if Colorado has indeed gone to pot. Well, if every revolution begins with a spark, then why not start our visit to Colorado on this marijuana tour? All right, guys, I'm going around passing out joints. One of the fun things I like to do Where the sparks are flying. It's billed as an educational insight into the marijuana industry. Anybody here, casual users, keep in mind this is the last disclaimer of the day. This is the last time I'm going to slow you down. From here on out, it's peer pressure, and then we're going to be going, 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 smoking, 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 smoking. smoking. There isn't an empty seat on Mike Eimer's bus. First thing you're going to see is called the Green Mile. Customers range in age from 21 to 81. The tour includes a visit to a grow up where people can get a closer look at Colorado's newest cash crop. Then it's back on the bus. All right, that is some good shit in there. You guys are going to want that. To sample, sample, sample. <laughs> if this is indeed a grand social experiment, then these lab rats are leaving happy. Just how high are you guys right now? Like in terms of like three quarters or like five quarters. Five quarters. I would is, just say all the way. That, I think that seems that that means a lot. Um, this interview probably would have been easier about an hour ago. Tourism is up in Colorado, and while no one suggests it's because of legalization, it surely isn't hurting business here. The legalization for me as a small business owner uh, allowed me to reinvent in a very, very positive way. It's giving me a career in the industry that I have always wanted to be in. So it, it's been great. Great and growing. Just one year in, and Colorado's marijuana market is already worth more than half a billion dollars. There are more than 100 recreational marijuana stores in Denver, another 200 in the rest of the state. They've sprung up everywhere, next to the local cafe, the children's hairdresser, or the neighborhood liquor store. Pot shops are now part of the local landscape. You have to be 21 and over to buy. And while the state sales tax is 2.9%, taxes on marijuana are closer to 29%. Last year, Colorado brought in about $60 million, money that would have gone to the black market. So how did the pot revolution make it to the American frontier? 
It took one guy armed with a simple idea. We'll get two beers, please. Absolutely. Brian Vicente and his team knew Colorado loves its beer. Heck, the state's own governor made a fortune brewing beer. So they argued marijuana should be legalized because it's safer than beer. Listen, you know, alcohol is everywhere in our society. Uh, it's just scientifically a more dangerous substance to the user. People die of overdoses of it all the time. And those uh, people don't die of overdoses from marijuana. It, it's not addictive in the same way that alcohol is. Uh, in fact, it has medical applications. Let's rethink our policies. Does that resonate with people when you say that? Listen, you're being a hypocrite if you think it's okay to drink beer, but you don't think it's okay to smoke pot. Yeah, I think that does reach some people. I think they say, you know, well, I'm an alcohol consumer, and I've, you know, almost everyone's been touched by alcohol in a negative way in some fashion. You know, their friend or their dad or someone was an alcoholic. They've seen what that has done. You know, if that person had the chance to use marijuana instead, would their life have turned out that way? Should we punish people who are using a less harmful substance? It just kind of gets the conversation going. Dear Mom, when I was in college... I used to drink a lot. It was kind of crazy. But now that I'm older, I prefer to use marijuana. Let's talk. Campaign ads like this kept the conversation going and going. A protest tonight over pot. Supporters had another talking point. They argued the medical marijuana market was thriving. So why not take the next step? I think it demonstrated to the public that marijuana wasn't necessarily this boogeyman that they they heard it was. And in fact, it could be pretty effectively regulated. And if we can do it for sick people, why don't we allow adults 21 over to do it as well? And it worked. 55% voted for legalization. We are happy here in Colorado. We've taken a step forward for common sense drug policy. Though most of the people who voted for it don't even smoke dope. Only 10% of Coloradans do. For many, it was a business decision. Tax it, regulate it, profit from it. In the past year, it's estimated 10,000 jobs have been created in Colorado's booming bud business, probably the fastest growing industry in the state. Take this bakery, for example. About half of the marijuana sold at Colorado's dispensaries comes in the form of edibles. So pastry chef Hope Fromm creates cookies, crackers, candies, even gluten-free options. If I were to eat one, what would I do? You would be feeling wonderful for the next six hours. That's exactly how it feels. It's just a nice little buzz. The buzz comes from marijuana leaves ground into a paste and blended with butter. That's the secret ingredient. It used to be that Love's Oven could only sell edibles to the medical marijuana market. But since recreational pot was legalized, sales at Love's Oven are up 1,000%. Here at the Denver Post, stories about growing and selling pot used to be strictly part of the crime beat. Now they're Ricardo Baca's beat. He's the newspaper's first ever marijuana editor. Have there been problems? Yeah, there have been many problems, but has there been mass tragedy or crazy crime increases or any of the things that the anti-marijuana lobby expected to happen? No. The biggest problem? Those marijuana-infused edibles. There were a few high-profile stories of people overdoing it. So the rules were quickly changed to limit the mind-altering THC content in the snacks and place warning stickers on packages. I think any of those people, especially... Baca considers these growing pains as Colorado embraces change. In the past year, when you walk down the streets of this city, do you notice a difference? Things have changed. Our, our social patterns are starting to change. You know? so. It's changed dinner parties, you know? It's changed the way we go to concerts. You can't go to, especially an indoor concert, anywhere in Denver and Boulder without smelling uh, the vaporizer. Um, at night, outside bars, you know, people will pop out, have a cigarette. People will pop out and have a joint or smoke half a joint or hit their vaporizer before going in and finishing their beer. Look at the size of that leaf. Isn't that great? But you really know you've won the battle to make marijuana mainstream when you win over the soccer moms. Isn't that awesome? People like Meg Sanders. You don't look like a pot grower. (laughs) 
What is a pot grower? Is there one in the dictionary? Is there a picture that I'm not aware of? <laughs> she runs a sprawling grow up in a chain of retail stores called Mindful. This all looks great. Have you tried any I've of them? I've tried. I like the sour ones. Mm -hmm. Her goal is to make buying cannabis as normal as buying a cappuccino or a bottle of Cabernet. What's up today, lady? I need an eighth and a gram. And her role in the revolution? Win over more women. I have a lot of female friends that are using this as a stress relief um, as opposed to potentially alcohol. So this is the new mother's little helper. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> I could just see a t-shirt already, get you? Um, no, but I mean, it's becoming very attractive to women. I can point to my very own mother, who is a school teacher forever, and you would think, oh my gosh, this retired school teacher uses cannabis. Well, she does, every single day, to sleep and to solve some pain that she has in her knees. And did she get into cannabis because of you? Yes. Oh my gosh, yes. So you turned your mom onto cannabis. I turned my mom into weed. Can you believe it? <laughs> Sanders has already opened up four stores in the state, but she has dreams of going national once the rest of the U.S. catches up to Colorado. So you get a really great euphoria, that mood elevation. But it's not just the growth possibilities that are potent, so too is the product. Those soccer moms may want to take a closer look. Back in the 60s, the marijuana that was sold had THC levels around 3 to 5 percent. This marijuana they're selling here, it has THC levels around 25%, but that's pretty mild compared to this. This is called shatter. It's a hash oil concentrate. It can have THC levels up to 90%. This isn't your parents' marijuana. Nope. This is your kids' marijuana. And it's the risks to young people that worry Donald Mish. He runs the health and wellness programs for students at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He voted against legalization, saying health concerns were downplayed in the campaign. The way this question is always posed, um, which is not a fair question, but if your child, if your son or daughter had to uh, abuse one drug, marijuana or alcohol, which would you choose? And the answer for me is marijuana. But that doesn't mean marijuana is entirely benign. He says for teens, regular pot use can diminish IQ, impair memory, and increase the risk of developing mental disorders. The other problem, of course, without So Mish's message to the student smokers is firm. Start later and use less. It is true that if you smoke a joint every now and then, and you're 18 or 25, the odds of it doing great damage to you, I think, are very low. But if you're a near daily or daily smoker, and the younger you start, the risks are considerably higher. Brian Vicente knows not everyone is celebrating the legalization of marijuana in Colorado. He suspects many want the social experiment to fail. But he's confident it won't, and confident legalization is coming soon to countries like Canada. Step by step, you know, every state in our country and ultimately pretty much every country around the globe will legalize marijuana, or at least have it for medical purposes. You know, at some point in the future. Um, our, our goal is to sort of accelerate that. When we come back, is Canada next? It's actually about democratic principles. 70% of Canadians want the law to be changed. Here in Vancouver, a simple stroll down the city streets is revealing. It seems stores that are illegally selling medical marijuana are everywhere. People are easily getting what they want, where they want it. The federal government's official medical marijuana system, designed to stop such abuse, is clearly broken. But it's not just Vancouver. Right across the country, people are finding ways to get what they want. Meet Jake Munir. He believes so strongly in the benefits of medical marijuana, he wrote a song about it. It'll help you. Yeah, you can smoke it, you can vape it, you can talk your medication. For him, it's a cause, but to the cops, he's a crook. 
Jake lives in Peterborough, Ontario. Two years ago, he was busted for possession of almost one pound of pot. He says he was smoking it to relieve his anxiety and depression. The police didn't buy it. Marijuana can really help me focus, get me on task. Like, I work two jobs seven days a week now, no problem. Strain is called headband. It's a 30% indica. Facing a criminal record, what was he to do? Well, Jake heard if he got a doctor to write him a prescription, the charges would be dropped. His doctor wouldn't, so he hired a cannabis consultant who found him one who would. Uh, well, I'm flying to Vancouver first, then to Kelowna to get uh, my license for medical marijuana. Sure, he had to fly across the country, but if that could help him beat his charges, who wouldn't? Within 36 hours, Jake was back. It all went good out there. Did it? Yeah, everything's good. Okay, so this is the new prescription. Yeah, just my name, 12 months and all that. After 44 court appearances in his case, Jake's finally breathing easy now. Do you think now that you've got your prescription that you're going to get your charges dropped? Yeah, positive. Because they, they can't, what are they going to convict me on? But you you would convince people that you weren't doing this yeah. just to get your charges yeah. dropped. Yeah, it helps me. and It is medicine. I know it's medicine. Jake insists he's not gaming the system. But we wondered, just how hard would that be? With a couple of phone calls and knowing some people, you can very quickly find out uh, what doctor to go to and to get that recommendation. Benedict Fisher is a criminologist and an expert in substance use. He says the rules are so loose, you can ask your doctor to prescribe pot for virtually any medical condition. I mean, if you can't come up with a reason for that, you're either bloody stupid or you don't deserve to smoke a joint on a regular basis. But isn't this de facto legalization if I can buy marijuana when and where I want it? In essence, Mark, that's exactly what we have now. We have in Canada an emerging uh, situation of de facto cannabis legalization under the veil of medicalization. Don't tell the Conservatives this. Well, I don't have to, Mark, because they invented this thing. So the system that was supposed to give sick people access to medical marijuana now seems to be giving just about anyone access to it if they really want it. And that's triggered a debate about whether the solution is just to face this reality and legalize marijuana. So 92 years after pot was outlawed in this country, legalization is now a smoking hot political issue. strongly opposed to the legalization of drugs. It will not happen under our government. Uh, legalization of marijuana will be part of the Liberal Party platform. When Justin Trudeau's Liberals came out in support of legalization, the Conservatives pounced. The Liberal leader shall apologize to Canadians for his role as the Pied Piper of pot. It doesn't sound like Justin Trudeau has the kind of judgment we need in a Prime Minister. We don't want to see the normalization of marijuana. <laughs> The political problem for the Conservatives? It's not just these hardcore cannabis consumers who want to soften Canada's marijuana laws. If you believe the polls, it's the majority of mainstream Canadians. Canada wants a change, and it's about time that the government listens to it. And it's been consistent, by the way, since 1972, 70% of Canadians want the law to be changed. They're acting as if it's just happening now that public opinion is changing. Alan Young is a lawyer who's been fighting to reform Canada's marijuana laws for the past 30 years. He says now that four states in the U.S. and counting have legalized pot, change in Canada is inevitable. What is the importance of, of what's happening in the United States now? What impact do you think that will Critical. have on Canada? Look, the United States has always been a you know, foreign policy bully. They go around telling countries what to do, and one of the things they would do is say, don't drop the drug prohibition. Now that the United States has changed, and the major opposition to other jurisdictions changing their policy has been removed, there's not going to be trade sanctions, there's not going to be reprimands, it's the beginning of the end. Given the fact that there is still this political resistance, why are you bullish in saying that I think in five years it'll be legalized? Money makes the world go round. That's what's fueling the change in the United States. It's all about tax dollars and law enforcement dollars. And we have the same economic crunch. 
Oh, and while we're on the subject of money, remember Chuck and his Vancouver vending machine? Take it home, smoke it, you don't like it, bring it back, we'll give you a full money back guarantee. Since we first spoke to him three months ago, he says his one machine has now grossed more than a million dollars. I put on some $5 sale grams. He's buying another and opening more stores. Chuck wants to force the issue by challenging Ottawa, either shut me down or tax me like any other business. They need to get down here or they need to invite us over there to sit down with them and work out a program that works. If the illegal dispensaries are making millions, the legal grow-ups banking on tens of millions, adding up to a global marijuana market worth tens of billions, then the burning question is how can any federal government resist the temptation to just try it? The legalization debate, coming soon to the federal election near you.